I have fallen foul of the curse of open source um, presentation tools. My uh, talk is done in LibreOffice, um, so I have to do it as PDF, and that means I can't have the slides on front and on the back. So if I keep on turning that way, it's to remind myself what I'm saying. I want to look today at the role of software in validating hardware, because that ties into the theme of how do we get high-quality silicon IP. Um, and I'm going to go through, I'm going to give you a definition of what I mean by verification um, and indeed validation. I'm going to explain a particular problem which you need to address when you're looking at using software to validate hardware. Because we're talking pre-silicon, we're going to depend on modeling the silicon, so let's have a look at what's out there in the free and open source space. And then how do we use those tools so that software can be used to help verify hardware? And then I'll wrap it all up at the end. So um, this is a software engineer's definition. Verification is about our asking, having defined our product, are we building it correctly? And by validation, we want to know if we're building the right product in the first place. And you do have to do both of those. Most of what I'm talking today is about verification, but actually one of the advantages of doing things in models, you can actually decide before you make silicon if you're building the right silicon. What's the problem? I want to tell you a story, which will show how long I've been in this game. 1999, the project to create the Open Risk 1200, the first really serious attempt to do an open source processor platform. And it relied purely on software to check that the chip was good. It had 12 programs, 12 little programs. You may think the programs in mBench are small. They're not as small as these ones. And those programs worked by generally printing out dead beef on success. And if you got 12 dead beefs printed, the chip must be perfect. And that was how OpenRisk, which was used in the very early versions of Pulp, was verified. Until 2010, when we were very grateful to Mr. Wakas Ahmed, who did um, MSc at KTH in uh, Sweden. And there is this telling little paragraph. Only 58 instructions could be included in the verification test because 20 instructions are erroneous or not implemented. And the reason being, the compiler never generated them. So when you ran that software, you didn't realize they weren't there. So the moral is, software alone is not sufficient to verify a chip. However, I hope I'll show you in the rest of this talk that it is a very useful adjunct to improve the quality of your chip and adds to what you would do in proper hardware verification. Because we're pre-silicon, let's look at how you can model a chip, so you can work with your chip before you've actually got a chip. And we're also, when we verify, we're going to have to look at two sorts of verification. Functional verification, does it do what I want? And that can be tool tests, it can be um, application tests, it can be regression tests. You can have compliance tests, and we know quite a lot about the Risk Five compliance group. And of course, the most important ones, the customer specific tests. And you'll also need non-functional verification. So standard benchmarks and of course mBench, some of you will have heard about earlier in the week and please come and talk to me about it. And earlier ones, Beebs, MyBench, worst case execution tests and so forth. And again, the ones that matter, the customer specific benchmarks, because that's the thing you actually want to know how fast it goes. So what sort of software simulator are we going to use for this verification? Well, the first one we have are the very fast high-level emulators. Compiling emulators, dynamic binary translation. The two well-known ones are QEMU, and of course we heard earlier uh, from Michael about Renode, which for the embedded space is arguably the better choice. You can also hand-write models. And System C has been around for a long time, and in particular defines a transaction-level modeling structure, which is actually semantically quite clean. System C is technically not open source, because although it's all freely available and do what you like, you do actually have to guarantee to support Synopsys in defending infringements of the logo. 
um, which breaks the open source rules. No one has ever done that. But, um, and if you want to go to a bit more detail or a different side model, you may only be care about the functionality of the individual instructions. And you then get instruction set simulators. You can write them by hand, tools like Spike, or you can generate them automatically. And the big, the, the granddaddy of that, of course, is CGen, which is part of the GNU tool chain, which takes a scheme district from description of the syntax and semantics of an ISA and generates an assembler, disassembler, and simulator. But um, Simon Cook um, from Embercosm has written on how you can do exactly the same with table gen in the LLVM world. I want to get to a bit more detail. Well, once you've got VHDL or Verilog, you can use tools like GHDL. Um, oh, no, you've got that way around. I've done it back to front. So the real detail is the... Um, the full event-driven simulators. Now, these are four-state simulators. They'll tell you everything's going on. And in the open source world, we've got GHDL for VHDL and Icarus Verilog for Verilog. And then a bit quicker and a bit less detail, we've got Verilator, very well-known, cycle-accurate model. So it's only two-state. It won't tell you what's going on in the middle of a cycle. Um, and it follows synthesis semantics. So it's quite good, because it really behaves like a chip behaves. Um, and because it's not so detailed as a full event-driven simulator, it goes reasonably quickly. And certainly if you take something like uh, Clifford Wolf's very small um, Pico Risk v on my laptop, you can clock that at about 4 megahertz, fully cycle accurate with Verilator. So you've got a lot of tools available in the open source world. And we heard from uh, Olaf, of course, um, few sockles spit out Verilator models quite happily. And I presume Icarus Verilog ones as well. Yeah, there we are. It's award-winning for a reason. Um, now, there's all those simulators. I want to tell you a story. This is about the Verata Helium 210. How many people have heard of this chip? Not surprising. You may have used it. It's 20 years old. It was the state of the art in uh, DSL handling um, uh, back in the days of when DSL went at a few megabits. And it had every conceivable DSL interface you could want, and it was driven by two ARM processors, which you can just about see in the model, one to act as an I.O. processor, one to act as a control processor. Now, this was quite state-of-the-art because they actually developed the entire tool chain, they developed the entire software before the silicon was even produced. When the silicon, first silicon came back from the, the fab, not only did it work first time, they were able to demonstrate the product up and running that afternoon because all the software already worked. Now, how did they do that? And the answer is they didn't use any one modeling technique. They used a hybrid model. Okay? They had a fast model. It was actually a handwritten model of the processors and the memory subsystem. And they used cycle-accurate models, a tool called VTOC, which was like an early proprietary verilator, um, for the peripherals, and then they hand wrote some glue in the middle to model the buses and the interrupt handling and so forth. And so the hybrid modeling technique's been around for a very long time. And the good thing is it's getting easier to do. These days you'd use QEMU or Renode for your fast modeling, and you'd use Verilator, Icarus, or GHDL for your accurate modeling of your peripherals. Um, and this gives you the compromise. You get good, fast performance, and then you break out your peripheral where you get very accurate behavior to make sure your peripheral behaves what you want. You don't have to spend ages writing C models of every peripheral. You can generate them automatically from the Verilog. And you get a good compromise performance. It's fast enough to run your software seriously, but it gives you functionality, and it's quick to build. And if you go to, I'm not sure if Ant Micro have still got their demo up, but earlier in the week, you could have seen their demo of Renode integrated with Verilator doing exactly this with a processor model of RISC-V and a Verilator model of a UART. So you've got all those models so you can run your software. So how do you then verify it, whether it's the functional verification of behavior or the non-functional verification of performance? Well, this is the basic framework of any software testing in an embedded world. You've got your application whatever it is. You've then got a compiler or assembler to translate it. You've got a linker to put it all together, libraries to give you extra functionality. And then you give it to your debugger. And your debugger will then connect to the target. And that target could be a simulator or it could be a hardware. But because we're before silicon, because we're verifying, we're going to use the simulators. Okay? 
And by doing that with simulators, you can run all your software on your target and check it behaves as you want. And indeed, you can do both verification, does it do the correct thing, and validation, is this really the product I intended to build? And actually, from a software perspective, that tends to be more important than you might think. So, here's an example. This is TechEdSat. Um, TechEdSat um, was flown by NASA, um, and uh, they used a hardened version of the OpenRISC 1200 in that, and NASA actually insisted that if they were going to use an open source hardware, they actually had a decent compiler. So OpenRISC always had a GCC, but it was a bit flaky, and Embercosm were paid to actually professionally get it all working, make sure it's good. And so we started off with getting the compiler going on AuxSim, which is the golden reference model for OpenRISC. And we were able to run the GCC regression test, and you can tell how old, old this is. There's only about 50,000 of them. Um, these days, there's more like 100,000 C tests. And we could run those and see some passes and some failures, and then we could go away and fix the failures. But the interesting thing is, we also had the Verilog available. So we could do the same tests and instead use a Verilator model of the Verilog. And because they're supposed to be the same, they should give the same results. Except they don't. And why do we get differences? Well, sometimes those tests were failures just because the, the Verilator model is slower and the test timed out. But that usually gives you an unresolved test. It doesn't give you a failure. So the other reason is because the behavior is different. And those tests actually indicated issues in the Verilog, which we could then go and fix. And in the end, you want to get to the stage where you get no failures, whether you run it on the golden reference or whether you run it on the <coughs> um, actual platform. And that's been used by other people. Um, and at the time, not long after we did this, we also did the same for Adaptiva. And some of you will remember the Epiphany processor and the Parallela project. And Andreas Olofsson, who was the chief executive, very much into these sort of technologies, reckoned we found 60 to 70 flaws in the silicon through this testing running in parallel with his hardware verification. And when the first Epiphany Real Silicon came back, it worked first time. So very powerful tool. And you can do this with everything. Now, so if we look at the harder, can we make that comparative testing a bit harder? Because it's easier. Because at the moment, we run one set of tests, another set of tests, and they go line by line through all the re test results to find out what's different. So this is the way, at the bottom level, the interface is working. The debugger is split into two halves. You've got GDB, your debugger, and then you have running connected to your actual hardware a program called a GDB server. And it's prior dividing very simple functionality. It can read and write registers. It can read and write memory. It can start the program. It can single step the program. And when it stops, it can tell you where and why it stopped. So GDB servers are typically very small programs. And then they have an interface to either control a very later simulator by clocking the model round or real hardware by driving a JTAG interface. So and those are, that's something that my company does a lot of. And they're very straightforward programs to write for embedded uh, platforms. So that's what we used. And of course, the first time we ran it with AuxSim, and the second time we ran it with a Verilator model. Okay, and we ran the two separately and compared them. But how's this for a cool idea? Lockstep debugging. So GDB server thinks it's talking to a single target. But actually, underneath, we are stepping two models, our golden reference and our Verilator model. And if they, after each step, look the same, that's all fine. But if they differ, we raise a GDB exception. So you run your program under lockstep on your golden reference and on your target hardware. And actually, you can do it with real hardware as well if you've, once you've got your silicon. And the moment they diverge, you get an exception. And then you can use all the functionality of GDB. What location did I drop out on? What's the backtrace? Where did it go wrong? And you can see exactly what instructions are. Incredibly powerful. That's being used today by one of our customers developing a 256-core RISC-V platform, and it's central to what they do. So, in conclusion, software is an extra layer of hardware IP verification, and if you want validation. Okay? 
Don't rely on it exclusively. Remember the OR1200 experience. There are loads of open source tools to help you. Okay? You can use this in an entirely open source environment. Take the free tools. Employ people like Olaf, me, to maintain them for you if you're worried about you know, actual reliability. And lockstep debugging makes this really, really easy. And if only there was a FOSS tool to do lockstep debugging. Well, fortunately, there will be. It's nearly finished. If you come to OrConf, you'll be able to hear all about it. If you're desperate to get your hands on it earlier as part of the pre-release development team, come and speak to me or Simon, who's behind the camera at the back there, and let's see how we can get it going. It will be fully free and open source. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much. Yes, questions? Yes. Uh, thank you for your kind words about Renode. Uh, I have a question about the lockstep debugging itself, uh, because it's a very interesting idea. Uh, if you could actually go back to the slide. Uh, cool. Next. Oh, that's great. Well, since we're doing Renote, I'm mostly interested in the part that between the lockstep target and the ISA simulator, what interface does a simulator uh, have to fulfill? Uh, is that the same of the GD uh, GDB server? Probably not. Uh, is it that, uh, do you implement a specific GDB server for, uh, for this kind of solution, or is it a separate uh, entity? How does it work in two words? We have um, tried to develop a clean interface there, um, and we've tried to make it flexible enough that it can cope with everything like real hardware, doing JTAG or whatever your favorite debug interface, through to event-driven simulation, um, where the, typically the, the event-driven simulator is in charge and you're a client of it, uh, through to verilator, through to high-level models. That is still being polished. Okay, and that's why I'm not announcing the product today. Okay, so you know, get involved. Oh, you guys know us well anyway, but come and talk to us afterwards. Okay, so we're, we're still polishing the last corners of that. Where's the cube? Down here. All right. yeah, this sounds very interesting. Uh, uh, is your interface flexible enough to uh, compare to very different processes like? Ariane and Rocket in one lockstep simulation. Oh, how exciting. I hadn't even thought about that. That would be really interesting to do, wouldn't it? I mean, one thing is you've got to choose the boundary of comparison. You know, if you've got, you can't do cycle by cycle comparison if you've got people with different microarchitectures because it ain't going to work. So you typically are going to choose at most the boundary of the instruction, and that's probably quite a good space. I've I've retired this instruction, I've retired that instruction. Does the state of my processor look right? And what bit of the state am I concerned about? Am I concerned about the registers, the memory? It does affect your performance. If you're actually going to say, my lockstep comparison is at the end of each instruction, every register's the same, that's easy. And the whole of memory is the same, a bit harder. Okay, so it's quite fluid. It's not cast in stone what we mean by the state is the same, you define that yourself. So there's a bit of flexibility there. Thanks. Any more? No. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>